There's a lot to be said about Plato's Apology, and we're only going to be able to touch on just a little bit. We're going to focus on just a couple arguments, a couple of the philosophical arguments that come up in the Apology, and I hope that you will uh, delve into some other questions and aspects of it in the discussion forums. Uh, now, the Apology is Socrates' defense speech. Socrates was put on trial and executed for impiety in 399 BCE. The charges brought against him were three, not worshiping the gods of the state, introducing new gods, and corrupting the youth. Uh, and we want to look at how, how Socrates responds to those particular charges. Now, one other thing to note about the Apology, it's unlike any of Plato's other dialogues. As you will see shortly, if you don't know already, Plato wrote his philosophical works almost entirely in dialogue form. In most of his dialogues, Socrates is the main interlocutor, the person conducting and leading the conversation. The Apology is a little different. The Apology is also the only dialogue of Plato's in which Plato mentions himself and specifically mentions himself as being present. And so it may very well be that he is indicating that this is indeed a record. In his other dialogues, as far as we know, in general, all of the characters are actual historical figures, but the situations in the dialogues are invented. And so, perhaps here we have some indication of the character of Socrates. Perhaps this is something like Socrates really sounded like in his, uh, at his trial. Now, let's look at uh, these arguments, a couple of, just a couple of arguments here. Let's first look at this argument uh, uh, about the corruption of the youth, the charge that Socrates was corrupting the youth. Notice how Socrates handles this particular charge that he is corrupting the youth. He never, in fact, denies it. He doesn't say, I wasn't a corrupter of the youth, although it's fairly clear that he thinks he is a benefactor of youth and in no way harmful to them. But instead, what he says is, he says that if I corrupted the youth, it wasn't intentional. And notice that he has an argument. He's not simply making a profession of his own sincere uh, intentions in any way. He's not getting up and saying, oh, I didn't mean to do it, please believe me. He's making an argument. He's saying that it's not possible that he could have intentionally corrupted the youth. Why not? And note that this, this argument would apply not just to Socrates, but it would apply to anyone. Socrates asks, well, by corrupting the youth, what do we mean? And notice that that's something that's actually relatively vague here. That's not defined in this. It's one, one of the peculiar aspects of these charges. Uh, but uh, he asks, is corrupting the youth benefiting them or is it harming them? So obviously corruption is bringing harm to someone. It's bringing a kind of harm. So if Socrates is indeed corrupting the youth, then he's doing them harm. If he's doing them harm, he's making them worse, not better. But these youth are fellow citizens of Socrates. They live in the same society with him, and he has to have them as his neighbors. He has no personal interest in he can have no personal interest in having worse people rather than better people as his neighbors. Because, and this is an additional premise of this argument, because no one wants to be harmed. Everyone wants to be benefited. No one wishes to be harmed. And so, if Socrates indeed were corrupting the youth, he would be undertaking an action that could lead to his own harm Therefore, this is not something that he would ever intentionally or knowingly do. Now look closely at that argument, because you're going to need to look at this in the context of the next dialogue you read, the Crito. Crito extends this 
argument to something further. And you're going to want to see how that works. Okay, so I'm asking you to do this. Uh, you're going to want to see how that works. It's going to be a broader argument. Notice the argument in the uh, apology is somewhat restricted. In the Crito, Socrates is going to, in effect, advance the argument that no one does any kind of wrong intentionally. All wrongdoing is wrongdoing that's done out of ignorance. Although he recognizes that most people will never be persuaded of this or believe this, that's what he's arguing. Now, one other thing we want to take a look at quickly in uh, the Apology are these charges right, that he uh, doesn't worship the gods of the state on the one hand and introduces new gods on the other hand. And we see what Socrates does with this, and it's very interesting what he does and how his accuser Miletus reacts to what Socrates does. Now, there's no contradiction evident in the way the charges are written, that uh, even though the charges themselves might again be something that's somewhat peculiar. In a polytheistic society, bringing in new gods is uh, not typically considered some sort of a crime. Rather, it would be something that uh, might be welcomed. Nevertheless, we're going to set that aside. There's nothing particularly sp uh, specifically contradictory about these two charges. And again, Socrates doesn't deny the charges. Socrates doesn't say, oh, but I do, I am religious, I do follow the gods, or no, I don't, I didn't go about introducing new gods from elsewhere. He doesn't specifically deny the charges. Instead, he asks Miletus some questions. And in particular, he asks Miletus to clarify what he means when he says that Socrates doesn't worship the gods, the gods of the state. He asks Miletus, is it the case that Socrates just doesn't perform the proper rituals or do something uh, that he ought to with respect to the gods, or if he doesn't believe in gods at all? And Miletus says that it's the latter, that Socrates is an atheist. He doesn't believe in gods at all. Uh, so, now this sets Miletus up for a contradiction, because if Socrates is charged with worshipping and introducing new gods on the one hand, but not believing in any gods on the other hand, then this is contradictory. The charges contradict themselves, though the charges in that respect seem to be absurd. Now, you might wonder... Um, whether Miletus didn't see this coming when Socrates asked him this question. So maybe he didn't, but think about things from the standpoint of uh, Miletus, from the rhetorical standpoint that Miletus might adopt. Socrates is asking Miletus, okay, do I just not do certain things that you think I ought to be doing, or are you saying I don't believe in any gods at all? What's Miletus answering? He's addressing the jury there, the jury of 501 Athenian citizens, a very large jury there. And he's trying to persuade them that Socrates is a bad guy. Does it sound worse if Socrates just doesn't do certain rituals that maybe somebody ought to do? Or does it sound worse if, uh, or that he just doesn't, you know, respect the particular gods that uh, Miletus wants him to respect? Or does it sound worse if Socrates doesn't believe in the gods at all, which most people believe? Obviously, it sounds much worse to brand Socrates as an atheist. So rhetorically, Miletus is going this route. We see strategically for the purpose of the trial, and rhetorically, Miletus is taking the clever route to try to get towards the conviction that he wants to obtain even if by doing so he makes himself look like an idiot because he's uttering something co totally contradictory to other things that he's claiming. So keep an eye out too. You'll see politicians do the same sorts of things all the time. They don't necessarily mind looking like an idiot if there's some political advantage to be gained by it. 
even if what they're saying is totally implausible. You'll see that Socrates has interrogated Miletus also on the corruption charge, and there, too, he makes Miletus look rather foolish. But on the other hand, Miletus is willing to look foolish while he can take advantage of the opportunity to flatter the audience, to try to make the jury look good and win them over to his side. Well, there's much, much more that's going on in the apology here. Uh, but we'll, we'll um, okay, that last a little bit. Well, there's much, much more that's going on in the apology here. So read it through very, very carefully. See what else you can find in there. Raise your own questions and bring your own interpretations to the discussion forum. In our next meeting, we'll talk just a little bit about certain parts of the Crito. Again, a short dialogue that we can only touch and scratch the surface on.